Okay, let's make a start. Um, so, welcome everyone. This is the um, Sibsi Building Simulation Awards 2021. Um, we have um, several hours now where we'll be, um, first of all, starting off with um, my welcome, and I'll give you a quick overview of the Sibsi Building Simulation Group activities. Um, then we'll be moving into the crux of the awards where um, there will be the um, shortlisted presentations hosted by the judging team. And then I will take over with a, um, a discussion on group vision 2050, uh, where we have a uh, invited uh, panel team, which um, will be talking about um, building simulation and the climate emergency. Then we're moving into the announcements of the Young Muddlers Awards and um, we'll be finishing with the main Building Simulation Awards results. So um, let's make a start. So my name is Darren Wolf. I chair the Building Simulation Group. And this is just a very quick um, summary of the group. We were established in 2009. And if you see the um, members, at the um, base here, the statistics, we have a reach for uh, to over 12,000 uh, people. Uh, we target uh, to organise two or more seminars, seminars over the year, and then we um, disseminate best practices and, um, and we have our past presentations on the website. So that link there is a shortcut to our website. You can still get it from the uh, mainsibsy.org website um, and then we support publications and give guidance to industry so I'll be talking about uh, a number of those um, activities over the uh, following slides but please do um, follow us on social media um, we have um, LinkedIn accounts and Twitter accounts so first of all I want to talk about some of our subgroup activities we've had a, we have a cert group or certification group that has been um, uh, formulating um, material over the last year or so um, it's chaired by uh, Ben Abel and they've been producing a set of introductory learning modules based on the AM11 chapters there's uh, an expectation that the first release um, will be um, supporting airborne infection modelling, carbon energy reduction, operational energy models and TM54 application um, in many ways. But the key chapters um, that will cover that uh, are the ventilation chapters, the thermal modelling chapters and the HVAC modelling chapters. Um, and we, we are in the post Grenfell um, era and uh, competency um in, in what we do is is going to be coming more and more into our activity so we think the timing of this initiative is is very good and when we start to um to uh use these learning modules um then i think it'll be very very important for our industry to start to uh, take up some of these um courses and demonstrate their competence then there's a uh, SBEM initiative, and this is chaired by David McConnell. Um, I say SAP question mark. There's an open question mark whether we will start to look at the SAP side um, as well as um, SBEM. Um, so we'll, we'll report on that in due course. But on the SBEM side, uh, David will be leading the initiative to uh, support forthcoming updates on the SBEM tool undertaken by BRE in response to the national climate change objective. So that sort of feeds in quite nicely to the discussions we'll be having in the interim session as well. Then there's the publication side. If you um, remember um, in the last year, um, we um, announced we had a uh, best practice initiative and that we were um, thinking of uh, what was at the time a working title of a publication called Simple Blinds. Uh, we worked over the course of the year and that's um, now called a good practice guide to dynamic thermal modelling of basic blinds. 
So my, my co-authors, um, Gabby and Bahare and Elpida, um, were the um, primary um, drivers for this publication, but we met with a wider committee um, and we met one hour per fortnight. Um, we submitted the initial draft um, back around June time. Uh, we've, uh, we now have a um, SIBSI approval of that draft um, and we've just got the uh, peer review uh, feedback um, that's been completed. So we're projecting that there will be a um, final draft by the end of January next year and a launch event um, Q2 next year, if, if not before. So you know, why, why are we excited about this um, publication? Um, if I were to say to you that your estimates of air temperatures um, might be off by several degrees um, because there hasn't been a, a, a good, a well thought through and good capture of blinds in your models, then that's um, obviously the repercussions of that through the various ways that we use dynamic thermal modelling um, uh, could be um, pretty significant. So the the um, the publication starts off giving a little bit of context, uh, moves um, into looking at some of the physics, um, and then um, we have a section on inputs, and um, and then there's a key section called how to where we're looking to um, to guide you through all the various things that you need to think about in order to um, have a good capture of blinds in your dynamic thermal models. And finally, we, we um, talked to, about various other considerations that you may need to think about. So um, look out for our announcements on the launch event, and um, we may try and make the launch event um, with a little bit of a twist. You should hopefully all be aware of AIM 11, Building Performance Modelling. That was issued back in 2015. Our group had a, um, a uh, quite significant role in, um, in helping to drive that. Um, it has been proposed that um, we have an update. Uh, we're very early on in that. Um, uh, we're only at, at, the, at the proposal stage, and this would be led by Hazim, who led the original um, publication. So uh, again, you know, I'll be I'll be talking about how you can get involved. Please do get involved. Offer your support to um, what we're doing within the group. Then events, um, you know, events are one of the main things that we do. Uh, besides the Building Simulation Awards and um, this event, we had a major event back in May which was called uh, Estimating Airborne Infection Through Simulation Analysis. This was a joint event with IBIPSA England. Um, and within it, there was um, uh, two of the AirBods team, Malcolm and Ben Jones, um, talk about AirBods and SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, by aerosol, um, uh, airborne aerosols. There was a schools presentation from um, the CoTrace um, scheme, uh, sorry, research project, led by Paul Linden. Then there was um, Fred, who you'll be seeing a little bit later um, on his Ventisi programme, talking about the return to work imperative. And then um, we invited um, some researchers, Frank and Elizabeth from UCL, um, which looked at um, some of the more sort of behavioural aspects. And I finished off with a, a summary of building simulation airborne infection. So we, we think that was a obviously very timely event um, and, and a very successful event. So um, I'd like to share with you, that was actually part one. Uh, we have agreement with IBIPSA England that will host part two in February. So some of those um, three key research uh, programs, AirBods, Co-Trace and Ventisi and some other um, we're hoping to make it give it a bit more of an international flavour. Um, um, so it might be a slightly different format, but um, expect some details to follow um, in the coming months. Then there's our newsletter. The last one was in August. Uh, please do sign up 
to um, Building Simulation Group and to get that newsletter. Newsletter. It has the latest building simulation news, trainings, um, and um, events. Uh, we're always, um, yeah, we're, we're a voluntary sector group. We're always looking for newsletter contributions. Please do contact, if not the exec, um, uh, if you know um, any of the committee members, and they can bring it to our um, attention. And um, we're always looking for people to help support the um, various activities and events that we um, host within Building Simulation Group. So finally, I have a very, very exciting announcement. Um, you may have, um, I mentioned previously AirBods. Um, AirBods stands for Airborne Infection Reduction through Building Operation and Design for SARS-CoV-2. Um, it's a partnership of um, six organisations, five of them universities, and um, the website was launched today, airbods.org.uk. Um, on the website, um, we, we obviously have a sort of welcome page um, where we talk um, very high level about what we're doing. Um, the team, um, there's 20 of us um, across the six organisations in the about area, which shows our, um, uh, and, and in the research area, um, it describes our work packages. And this is the, the list of publications so far. Um, the list will just um, grow and grow. We have um, various um, contributions into the um, technical symposium in April. Uh, we've been in the news quite a bit. Why have we been in the news? Um, well, um, part of the team have been um, part of the core team in the events research program that has helped to um, open up our um, hospitality sector. So um, SIPSI are our key strategic partners. And if you look on the front page of SIPSI.org, you'll see the uh, announcement in the news there, which has just gone up. So um, please do go onto the site, have a look and keep coming back. This will be the main portal for the uh, research program to share its findings, um, to share its um, guidance, and they will also be generating some tools um, for um, uh, for using to help um, reduce airborne infection risk. So, at this point, I would like to uh, pass over to Darren to uh, take over the awards. Thank you, thank you, Darren. Uh, right. Yeah, so uh, hopefully you can all see my screen. I'm Darren Coppins. Uh, I'm director at Built Physics Limited, and I'm vice chairman of the Sibsey Building Simulation Group, and have been for a number of years now. Uh, I have the honour again this year to uh, act as the head of the judging panel, uh, which also gives me the honour of introducing you to my fellow judges. First up, we have Vasiliki uh, Koyuzu. Uh, Vasiliki is uh, the SIBSI BSG secretary and social media executive. She is a PhD researcher with the UCL Bartlett Institute of uh, Environmental Design uh, and Engineering and also Bureau Happold Engineering uh, and is looking at the integration of smart energy systems to the university campus scale. For her research, she is investigating uh, I beg your pardon. For her research, she's investigating the use of digital twins, uh, something that uh, I'm very interested in as well, and data integration for facilitating net zero carbon campus retrofits. With previous, re previous industry experience in building thermal modelling, she has been a judge for the BSG Awards since 2019 and has also won runner-up position in 2018. Next, we have Gabriella Costa. Gabriella is a specialist in sustainability consultancy for the built environment with a background on urban design and architecture. She works at the Useful Simple Trust, a family of design practices driving positive change to our environment. Uh, the practice is well known for the sustainability strategies for London 2012, Olympic Games, Rio 2016 and Meridian Water Master Plan. She has experience in building performance simulation for indoor environmental comfort, 
and has produced energy and sustainability strategies for a variety of projects from small schools to master plans. This is Gabriella's third year judging the Sibsi Building Simulation Awards at Build to Perform. In her spare time, Gabriella is actively involved in her local climate group and organises their repair cafe. She is also a shareholder of a community owned near to zero waste shop. As with previous years, none of us, none of the judges have seen any of the presentations you're going to see today. So we're seeing it for the first time, as are you. We have five this year. We usually have six, but unfortunately one has had to drop out due to confidentiality issues. After each presentation, we have an opportunity to ask a question. And once all the presentations are finished, we'll go away and deliberate and determine the runners up and the winner, all whilst the interim session debates uh, equally important matters. Today, we're also announcing the winner of the Young Modelers Award. Uh, this has been judged by volunteers from the Sibsi Building Simulation Group Committee. Uh, and Gob Gabriella Costa will be announcing the winner of the Young Modelers Awards after the interim session. I'd now like to pass to Alex, who will introduce the first shortlisted entry. Hello, my name is Patricia Pino, and I will be presenting on behalf of Worth Research this case study titled COVID-19 and the work environment. In this project, um, we completed a modelling for two floors of an office building in London for a client that wanted to make sure that he could offer a safe environment to employees in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. To do this, we, we, had, we knew that we had to model the transport of RNA copies of the COVID-19 virus and develop a metric that the client could use to assess the risk of infection of occupants throughout the space. For this purpose, we used a combined approach that used both dynamic thermal modeling and computational fluid dynamics, making the best use of the strengths of each piece of software. Data regarding building fabric, occupancy patterns, HVAC design and infiltration rates was collected and incorporated into a full design builder DTM model of the office building. The model was run over the summer and winter periods and the day and time within these periods that resulted in the highest CO2 concentrations was identified and selected for a steady state CFD modeling using ANSYS Fluent. We did this in order to capture the different convective airflow patterns that are dominant within spaces throughout the year. The DTM model solved for the effects of radiant heat transfer and informed key boundary conditions in the CFD model, such as wall temperatures. The DTM also provided us with an initial measure of CO2 concentrations. The DTM boundary conditions um, uh, gave, this, uh, gave us the boundary conditions for the CFD model, uh, specifically temperatures and heat loads at key times. The CFD then solved for the convective heat transfer and provided a representation of internal airflow patterns. Once we had the CO2 levels resolved in the CFD, we compare these against those we obtain in the DTM in order to validate the CFD model and have confidence in our setup. And we found that these correlated well. Estimated CO2 values um, were also used to assess the performance of the HVAC system and identify poorly ventilated areas within the floor spaces. For the next stage in our methodology, various emitters representing asymptomatic infected people were placed at various locations within the floor space. These locations captured a good variety of office spaces as well as locations um, that of relatively high CO2 concentrations. The emitters were set up as passive scalars so that the transport of RNA copies is dominated by the internal airflows. For this reason, the mode of transmission in our model is restricted to the transport of aerosol particles, as these are more likely than droplets to behave in this way. COVID-related variables were obtained for the, from the latest research literature, and these included a number of uh, RNA copies exhaled from asymptomatic infected individuals, a value for the limiting dose of COVID-19 RNA copies, which are required for a 63% chance of infection. We call this a HIN63, or the limiting dose. Information regarding the rate of inhaling and exhaling for an individual in typical office related scenarios. The model then provides us with an hourly airborne infection rate, and this is defined as the percentage of the limiting dose that an occupant would inhale in an hour if she or he were to stay in the same place for that period of time. For example, a 12 0.5% le level would indicate that a person would receive 100% of the limiting dose in an eight hour period. So there are some assumptions on our model that are specific to our model. And for example, only asymptomatic emitters are considered. 
um, that is aerosol particle transmission is dominant. Uh, minimum distance requirements are enforced of one meter. Masks are not being worn. Emitters are breeding at a rate of 1.5 hertz. Um, the model also assumes that emitters and receptors are in static positions. And in this model, there is no natural ventilation, but uh, the study could be adopted to include it. And similarly, all the supply airflow is composed of fresh air. Uh, adjustments would be, have to be made for recirculated air. Using this methodology, designers can understand the risk within their spaces and where to make improvements. Simple changes could involve rearranging of furniture, internal layout, and more significant changes could involve partial redesign of the HVAC systems. Where these changes are not possible, protocols for the use of the space can be established to minimize risk. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, that presentation. Um, a little bit shame that the right hand side was cropped um, whilst we ask a question. Uh, hopefully, um, uh, Alex, you can uh, see if you can sort that out for the next one. Um, I'm going to make sure the judges have uh, a, a copy of the uncropped version, which I've just checked and we, we do have so that we can uh, just view that when we actually do our judging in the interim session. Um, is the presenter on online? Can I can I ask for a question? Yes, I'm here. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, something I'd like to ask, you mentioned about um, using the uh, DTM model for the boundary conditions. Um, how did you decide at which point in the DTM, DTM being a dynamic model, that actually you took those boundary conditions from? Was it um, the most common boundary conditions or, or was there something special in terms of um, the values from what point of the model you took that from? Uh, should, should I share, turn on my camera or? Oh, uh, yes, please. Yeah, that'd be good. Thank you. Right. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, so for the DTM, well, a, a little bit came from experience with working with um, uh, the thermal environment and trying to have a good um, uh, representation of what conditions might be like inside the space in external in extreme conditions. So extreme conditions, we might say the coldest side of winter and the warmest side of summer. And the reason for that is because um, the interaction of um, during those two seasons, um, the convective flows are quite different because the HVAC system behaves very differently. So we applied some of that and we simulated uh, winter and summer conditions, but the exact day and time that was selected for the simulation on the CFD was the times where we had high levels of CO2 concentration. And that's because we saw that as an indication of the potential risk. So we're trying to uh, have a conservative conditions whilst at the same time having um, a try to cover for both eventual both extremes of the year. You're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, just going to check if any of my other judges have any questions, and uh, if not, we'll we'll move to the next presentation. But thank you very much for answering that. That's a good answer. I yes, if I may. Um, this is Gabriella. Hi. Um, I noticed that your conclusion uh, it's actually the worst room is kind of like a meeting room. Um, was that? Do you think it's that's related to the fact that it is a meeting room, like a, more of an enclosed space, or um, could you see because we couldn't see actually the right side? Um, was there any like open open areas that um, had a higher risk of um, passing on the 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 airborne viruses? Well, yes. Uh, well, that there are there are various factors that contribute to the riskiness. I think um, I don't know if it was obvious from the images, but the areas that were the furthest away from the core, from the center of the floor, were usually the ones that had the most um, um, high risk or high levels of CO2, or um, that performed the worst when once the um, infected individuals were included. And the reason for that is because most of the uh, most of the extract um, grills were in the middle of the call. So obviously, um, the furthest away you were from there, the harder it was for, for fresh air to, to be extracted. Sorry, for the air to be extracted. 
But the other reason was also to do with the layout of the rooms in terms of some of the rooms had vents um, at high level uh, and some of the rooms had, uh, you know, more than the occupancy, obviously, all, also impinged on results, um, as well as the internal location of the vent. So that particular office, um, we tested, we were interested in that office because we noticed that uh, the vents had been positioned um, uh, beneath desks and things like that. And uh, so we immediately saw it as high risk and we thought that that would could potentially cause problems, but also because it was an, uh, a room that was a, a personal office was meant to be enclosed for very often and as well as being very far away from the call where the extra grills were. So all those things kind of combined to, to cause really adverse conditions. In discussions with the client, I think he was, um, he was very receptive to the idea that he needed to have not just designed the, the, um, the grill so that they would be located away from desks, but also have a means to inform the occupants that they shouldn't be moving desks and placing them on top of grills, which sounds obvious, but for some reason, for occupants, it doesn't, it's not always the case. So, um, and the other thing was that because he considered that a personal office that he thought it might be safer to close that office during times of high risk or, or when the alarms you know national uh, the um and you know the national conditions dictated that the risk of covid was high closing it off simply because they wouldn't want two people to have a meeting within that room when one of the people is um, infected and asymptomatic that's great thank you uh, thanks very much um, right. Uh, did that answer your question, Gabriella? Yes, thank you. Superb. Um, thank you very much, Patricia. Uh, Alex, would you kindly uh, cue the next one, please? Yes, and apologies, Patricia, for the mistake in terms of saying. No worries, these things happen. So the, the next one is from Dima Farah Saleh al Qatani from the United Arab Emirates of University. So I'm going to say this now and hopefully it's going to work correctly this time. Greetings everyone. As to introduce our project to the CIBSE Awards 2021, our project is a design of library extension found in our UAE University campus, featuring a parametric dynamic facade done by the undergraduates groupmates, Atina, Zima, Hiba and Nov supervised by our Dr. Lindita Bandi. To start off by the table of contents, we will be showing our building purpose, modeling tools used, concept development, dynamic facade development, system optimization, building simulations, and lastly, 3D views. The building purpose is to design a university library extension located in the UAE University in Al Ain, United Arab Emirates. It features a dynamic parametric facade with the use of visual programming language or parametrization tools. The following modeling tools were used. Rhinosphere's 3D was used along its plug-in Grasshopper, mainly for the modeling of the dynamic parametric facade, optimization, and energy simulation. Autodesk Revit was used for modeling the whole building, rendering, and some simulation for the daylighting analysis. The last tool is PVSYST, which helped in simulating the solar energy system. This is the concept development of our library extension design and how we reached to the final form based on our scope and constraints. Coming to the slide, it shows the dynamic facade development of the dynamic facade pattern and the final shape we ended up with. It also shows our inspirational shape and how the script was written in Rhino Grasshopper plug-in to reach the result of the maximum visibility. The 3D structure of the facade shows the elements connecting the units to the building facade. The module size of each unit is 3 by 2 meters. In the 3D detail, each unit has a wide structure arms that supports the unit mechanism when it opens and closes. There is also the wide structure ring hub in the middle, which connects the Y arms to the acutator, which moves the Y arms by electricity generated from the building. Strut sleeves or beams connects the units to the structure, and there is a star pin connection that supports the Y arms end. Also, there is a fabric mesh frame that supports the fabric mesh made from PTFE. 
On the right, we have our visual section showing the view from the building's interior and how the dynamic facade maximizes visibility and visual connection between outdoors and indoors. A radiation analysis study has been done to determine the radiation on each spot of South Facade during different timings on equinox and solitus days, which will optimize the dynamic not to close and open all at once, but to shade red areas with maximum radiation and gradually close when no shading is necessary in lighter areas, and close completely in blue areas with minimum radiation. Using Rhino and Grasshopper, we built a script to simulate the total energy for the building. The script included parameters, which were the selection of the zones, openings, context, shading devices, the period of analysis, and the weather file of the site. The total site energy values were for the building with and without the dynamic facade. We were able to use this information by comparing the percentage of energy reduced, 30%. Next, we tried to use BUSYS to run a simulation on the solar energy system. Using the previous energy value we previously obtained, we considered it the energy demand for the system. The program calculated the number of PV modules and inverters that will be needed for the system. Another simulation was done via Revit on the daylight factor. The software ran a simulation for the project with and without the dynamic parametric facade. It supported the utilization of the facade on the project. Here are some of the render views using Brevet program. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Do we have the uh, the presenter uh, on the on the uh, session with us this afternoon? Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, Right, so I have a question from uh, Gabriella. Gabriella, if you'd like to ask a question. Yes, hi. Thanks for the presentation. It was certainly a lot to cover <laughs> um, in such a short amount of time. And I'm interested to hear about any um, benchmarking or research you've used to help you set out the operation of the of the dynamic facade did you use any so what, what would be your your assumptions towards the operation of it was it mainly solar radiation daylight how did you combine conflicting conflicting um points on on maximizing daylight but also controlling the solar gain uh, first of all thank you for your question um so yes we did have a key study on uh, a building called Al Bahar Towers. It's located in Abu Dhabi in UAU, UAE. So um, this building has achieved uh, lead silver. So uh, it basically was our benchmark. Um, and we also, uh, through this case study, we we managed to select the materials which were the PTFE for the facade itself, the facade mesh, uh, and. Uh, um, as you as you asked about the um, how can we maintain the visibility um, while while mean, while having the minimum uh, uh, glare, so uh, we have done as you have you seen in the presentation, we have done a daylight simulation uh, through Revit. So basically, the simulation helped us in uh, in uh, knowing how how much of the uh, these floor areas have passed in, in the daylight factor analysis. So it's uh, it reached to 86% uh, of the floor area that has passed the target for the daylight factor. Sorry, I realized I was mute. And that's with the shading uh, mechanism, 86% uh, pass on the daylighting, yeah? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, a lot of information in that uh, presentation, but uh, um, yeah, very uh, very concise and well presented. Uh, Alex, would you kindly line up the next one for us, please? Yes, of course. So the next one is from Kepki Medha, and is uh, the optimization of modular photobioreactor retrofit. So let's give me a sec.
Hi, a very warm hello to everyone from KSQ. I present optimization of modular photobioreactor retrofit. Inspiration for this came from Arab's BIQ house. The challenge here is to translate lab based results to building panels. Uh, the good thing is this is definitely the first step to reducing uh, carbon emissions and uh, arriving at a low carbon retrofit. The other challenges are how to translate photosynthetic efficiency to solar efficiency for simulation and how to translate self shading of panels and get the actual amount of solar energy absorbed. The other challenges are how to simulate the photobioreactor panel system and the modular system. But at the very beginning, we need to start with the building information model creation in Design Builder. This was done firstly by collecting weather data from the site and making site-specific and year-specific weather data files. The model had constructions, occupancies, and activities, all other data in it as well. The first step was to calibrate the model to match the existing model. And this was done by identifying the base load of the building from the energy consumption data and matching it uh, with the simulated data using zero occupancy simulation. The second step was to match the variable load by running a full occupancy and carrying out iterative simulation to match other details that we had about the existing building and the energy consumption. Once the annual consumption was met, the water consumption was also matched up in addition to the energy consumption. The next step was to match the building fabric calibrated using the temperature and humidity data we had from the data loggers for the indoor temperatures and match it with the simulated temperature and humidity. These calibration results were validated by running a separate simulation for winter and summer for a different year and comparing simulated results and the logged results. The uncertainty analysis showed acceptable limits. This model was further validated by comparing simulated gas consumption for each month for six months and comparing it with uh, the metered reading and again checking the uncertainty analysis. This was now ready for simulation and these were the three options for photo bioreactor panels and the third one was chosen for its simplicity. The others could be tried in subsequent simulation, uh, subsequent projects. The first step to meet the challenge of simulation was to correctly identify the material to design the photobioreactor. The most important thing was to research the microalgal suspension for its optical and thermal properties and an insulation layer was added to the building integrated uh, photobioreactor system to keep the thermal conductivity the u value of the wall solar efficiency was simulated using the photovoltaic category several options of uh, the bio panel as overhang and side frames were created. Um, the photobioreactor building integrated system was categorized in the simulation. Other options were photovoltaic panels and building integrated photovoltaic. These options were mixed and optimized for cost versus, uh, so minimize cost and maximize energy generation. The results were like this. In the northeast of the building facade, 
uh, photovoltaic was the best option. But at other places, especially northwest of the building facade, uh, photobioreactors could be a better option used synergistically with photovoltaic. In the future, simulation or projects, solar tracking and heat fluxes of the building uh, should be considered. Uh, solar tracking would increase the efficiency and heat fluxes would affect the microalgal production. That's all from me here today. Thank you. <clears throat> That's another very good presentation. Thank you very much for that. Do we have the presenter on the call? Yes, hello. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you for your presentation, very good. Uh, I have a very quick question then I'm gonna to pass to uh, one of the other judges. Um, is this, are the, are the bio panels actually going to uh, be fitted to the building? Yes, they are. They uh, are. Would, you like, would you like me to turn the video on this? That's yes, please, yes, thank you. Easier to talk. So, yeah. So they would be, uh, the assumption is, not the assumption, I mean, they are designed to fit to the uh, building a wall. So they would effectively become the wall uh, I, I or see. side hangs or overhangs. So I, that's I why see. insulation was added to maintain thermal conductivity. And so one of the other options was actually to do photovoltaics instead of these panels? That's right. So yes, okay. because because the energy production of these panels is very low, so it's 10%, but because only 50% of it is active solar cell, uh, active uh, algae cells, effectively you get only about 5%. So, uh, so why would people use them as building panels? So the advantage is that they have lower cost, so that's why uh, it's done. Uh, that's very good, thank you very much. Uh, Vasiliki, uh, have you got a question? <clears throat> Hello and thanks for a very uh, interesting presentation. Um, yeah, um, uh, well, on the first part of your presentation, you mentioned uh, calibration, extensive calibration exercise. Um, did you follow a certain calibration uh, method or procedure, um, or was it, um, yeah, based on uncertainty? Um, and then about the modeling of the bioreactors. I, I presume it's based on research, or did you have to do some sensitivity on that as well? So to your first question, uh, the thermal calibration was based on research. So I looked up previous cali sorry, if it's not, I, I looked up previous calibration studies uh, and uh, followed a methodolo methodology from another study. Uh, which was first to make the building information model and then, you know, the steps I followed. So they were, they are pretty much, uh, I think they are pretty much the norm, which other researchers would have followed as well. That's what I would think, or, or very similar to that. Uh, uh, the second, uh, the second question, uh, no, that we did not do uncertainty analysis for uh, photobioreactors. But it was based on extensive and, uh, research about how the microalgae grows, and uh, there's there's a whole a whole ton of equations about how they grow, and there's a, a whole lot of studies. But because there's so much uncertainty about the way algae grows, depending on sunlight and uh, environmental conditions, so I what I did is I looked for research done in similar conditions. So we identified latitude and other uh, parameters, and based on the research, uh, we arrived at an I arrived at an efficiency, what an efficiency estimate about what uh, it would, uh, what the panel would generate, and the other factors which we could simulate, which was sunlight, shading, uh, and the temperatures are simulated in Design Builder, but we did not. We did not uh, use temperatures to influence algal growth because the temperature was maintained in the panel. That was the assumption using the water and the uh, media. So um, there were research there. There is research. 
there is research about uh, the microalgal suspension, thermal conductivities and things. So we took values from those researches and uh, we took values of uh, the temperature and environment of Cardiff. And accordingly, these values were input in Design Builder. OK, great. Thanks for the comprehensive answer. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much for your entry. Um, Alex, could you please line up the next one? We seem to be missing the sound again, Alex. Uh, hello. Um, so I'm not Bahare. Uh, my name is Aaron. I'm one of her colleagues. Uh, Bahar has unfortunately had a medical emergency and is taking a few weeks off, uh, but she's done some great work here and I'm sorry that she had to miss this. Uh, so I'm going to use text from her award entry and some slides from a presentation she gave recently. So uh, this is uh, her words and her work and I'm just going to try to do it justice. Um, so dynamic thermal models uh, have a prominent place in the building industry. Uh, as their results can influence the building professional's decision on considering shading devices in buildings. However, very few research projects have illustrated the discrepancy uh, between simulated results themselves generated by various software tools and the discrepancy between the simulated results and the measured data collected uh, in real world case studies. Um, so this case study was conducted at uh, London South Bank University in March 2021 uh, to investigate the effect of considering uh, sealed internal cellular blinds on thermal retention. Uh, so here a suite of sensors recorded that adding a blind can have a, here let me go to the next slide, um, adding a blind can have an impact in three core areas compared to the absence of a blind. Uh, so that is reducing the window heat flux by 63% um, and a, assisting with occupants thermal comfort through increasing window to surface temperatures by 34% and that corresponds to an overall lowering, lowering of the energy consumption of around 50% uh, while maintaining a temperature of 24 degrees from 5 p.m. overnight to 8 a.m. Um, so these real-time results are then compared with the simulated results generated with four software packages. So those include uh, Design Builder, uh, Energy Plus, EDSL TAS, and IESV. Uh, so the core elements, uh, inputs from the real-world case study were all replicated as closely as possible in the simulated models, and in particular for the shading device itself, obviously. Um, as Design Builder is using the uh, Energy Plus engine, uh, input values for the shading device uh, in both Design Builder and Energy Plus were essentially the same. Uh, EDSL TAS has a similar approach to Design Builder, but does not have the required inputs for the perimeter gaps uh, around the shading device. IESVE has a completely different approach uh, and requires different input values for the shading devices. Um, as IES VE values for shading devices are not usually provided by the shading manufacturers, there's a higher chance of modelers using incorrect input values in, in IES VE. Um, so the resulting simulated models showed that all the software packages were able to predict uh, and model the window surface temperature and the window heat loss patterns. Uh, when the blind is present compared uh, to, to, to what is not present, very closely with the real world data. Uh, but none of them could predict the effect of the blind on the heating energy consumption. Uh, so I'm not showing the uh, simulated results on this graph because Bahar didn't include those in her submission, 
Um, so I would ask you to kind of look at the graph and imagine that the red and black lines follow quite closely between the simulated uh, data to what you're seeing here for the observed data, uh, but the blue uh, line uh, it would be nowhere close for the simulated data for, for any of the four modeling packages. Um, so Bahar carried out a sensitivity analysis on the results of all of those dynamic thermal models uh, and found out that the air permeability and infiltration of the blind are far more effective than the fabric of the blind itself in relation to window heat loss. Uh, however, the software packages used were unable to separate the proportion of total infiltration attributed to the window uh, and were not able, therefore, to truly represent the impact of the blind in reducing uh, window infiltration and consequently the heating energy consumption uh, reduction that you see on the screen. Um, so that is uh, her presentation, um, and I would try to hang around for questions, but will very much encourage you to follow up with Baha herself uh, when she's back uh, and, and healthy and with us all. So thank you very much for your time. Cheers. <clears throat> thank you very much for uh, taking the time to to put forward that presentation. Is, is the presenter on the call? Yes. Hi. Right. Super. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> you're not being, uh, uh, you know, the the originator of the work. So actually, we um, have had a question that that popped up, which was, um, has the paper been peer reviewed? And also, I'd like to ask, what's the intention for this work going forward? Um, yes, so part of the reason we couldn't show the results on the graph itself is because some of it is, is being submitted as part of a paper for peer review. So that process is ongoing. So I have to, yeah, I have the challenge of trying to represent her work very well and do it justice uh, without describing the details that are that are uh, submitted for peer review um, or without misrepresenting the details that obviously she knows that I don't because she's the, the expert on this. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm happy to try to field any of the questions as, as well as I can. So please don't uh, don't hold back. <laughs> um, apologies, having a slight problem with my connection now. I think I've got two going at the same time. So apologies for that. Um, yes, I think actually we'll probably uh, leave that there because I know we're running on over time a little bit. But thank you very much for taking the time to uh, to put forward that presentation uh, and uh, yeah, taking the time to be here today. So, Alex, can I ask you please to line up the next one? So, uh, so the, last, the last one is from uh, Julio Vita from With Research. Got Sarah screen now, clearly sound this time. Hello everyone, I'm Giulio Vita, Wind Engineer at Worth Research, and today I'm going to present our work on uh, an existing large-scale industrial bakery that we would like to put forward for the Building Simulations Award 2021 at SIPSA. As companies are tasked with 2030 carbon reduction goals, there is a request to upgrade and update uh, sometimes obsolete facilities. The problem with having an obsolete facility, which is also large, large scale and that uh, serves to the client to run his activity in this business, is that uh, we need to make sure that the investment is well uh, uh, utilized and that there is a reasonable return on the investment. So the approach that we have used is to perform a multi-scale model so that we are able to model at several levels the complexity of the system uh, as intended of the whole facility and everything that's happening in it. Um, in the first uh, instance, uh, a CFD model of production lines, uh, uh, meaning ovens, have, has been performed uh, and uh, a proposal for refurbishing a 30-year-old one, uh, one was proposed. And this involved a great deal of auditing validating the information uh, with IR imagery and also performing parametric testing because sometimes it's not even possible to gather information so we need to make sure that our assumptions are sensible. 
hit recovery opportunities have then be analyzed. And finally, a full CFD model of the whole bakery has been uh, built with this with the uh, gained information. The performance based design on, on the new ventilation system is then uh, a matter of negotiating between uh, different uh, uh, problems such as comfort perception of occupants, mold dispersion risk from the different activities inside the building, wind local wind speed on uh, conveyor belts uh, to avoid problems with the raw product uh, and the uh, skinning of the product. And last, uh, airborne infection risk to occupants. The model of the oven, ovens consisted of a high resolution CFD model and uh, a temperature field was obtained. Uh, it has been compared to IR imagery and uh, all the heat losses have been analyzed in detail and solutions to the refurbishing of the single oven have been proposed as well as a way of simplifying the model to be then introduced to the large, larger model of the building. After modeling production lines and ovens and auditing the building, is it possible to analyze heat recovery opportunities in order to find the optimum between investment and return period and to prospect with the client with what they can expect from our analysis. The CFD model of the bakery building had, has been performed first with an auditing phase where CFD, the CFD model results have been compared to IR imagery taken on site to check whether our assumptions on boundary conditions and temperature temperatures uh, were appropriate. The air velocity field and the thermal field have been analyzed to check whether the effects that were described sometimes uh, in a qualitative way by the client were present in our model. And then the performance of different uh, solutions to the problems were evaluated using the edge of air performance analysis that gives us a measure of how effective the ventilation is. After finding the optimal solution through the edge of our analysis, um, the performance based design and optimization of the ventilation system takes place. In this case, involving uh, mold dispersion risk through doors, hotspot analysis on whether to choose how to place extraction up vents to recover heat, to minimize any local air speeding on. Uh, conveyor belts where the product is sitting and to find where uh, airborne infection risk is particularly high, which in this case is unrelated to occupancy, but uh, uh, more on uh, ventilation. I thank you for your time and uh, I'm here if you had any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, is the presenter on the call? Good afternoon. Hello. Thanks. Great. Lovely to meet you. Um, thanks for your presentation. Uh, you seem um, very knowledgeable on, on in this area. Are you from a, a process or um, a manufacturing background, or are you more from um, building physics? Uh, my my background is wind engineering, so I specialize in um, computational wind engineering more in detail and. Uh, have dealt with a number of ventilation indoor problems as well as outdoor. And uh, could I ask you, um, what was the most challenging aspect of, of that project for you? The most challenging aspect was definitely recovering the information to uh, set up the boundary conditions. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have the capacity and the information to build a dynamic thermal model of the building, so meaning that we needed to have quite a high level of assumptions in terms of uh, the temperatures and uh, and the heat fluxes and uh, because all, all these components were extremely hot. So as I was saying in the presentation, it required us to try and test several uh, different assumptions and uh, uh, run a validation test case uh, uh, when we visited the facility in a specific day, which wasn't, uh, of course, what you would model in CFD with the hottest or the coldest day to then size the, the the ventilation system. So this was definitely the most challenging aspect. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much.
Uh, I don't think any of my other judges have any further questions for you. So um, thank you. And uh, thank you. I, I will uh, draw the presentations to a close. Uh, thank you to Alex for queuing them up and providing them for us. Uh, I uh, the judges and myself will go away now and deliberate. We will also view the first one again so that we see the full presentation and uh, decide on um, uh, who who the, the winners are. And uh, in the meantime, I'll pass you back to Darren, who will host you for the interim session. Thank you very much, Darren. And please just put in the chat when you're ready to uh, take over again. I'll just um, bring up. So hopefully you can see that. So this is the interim session. Um, we've built it as um, that we'll be sharing our vision 2050. Um, we have developed a um, this document, which hopefully will be in the chat soon, which you can uh, pick up. I think Alex may put that in the chat soon. So if you um, um, look out for that. Um, and um, I've labelled this session Building Simulation Modelling and the Climate Emergency. So what I would say is, um, Darren, that you've just um, listened to, is the um, lead author on our vision document um, and also this PowerPoint. And I've just um, added uh, my own little flavour to it. So we're going to start off um, giving you a potted um, history. Um, and um, we're all very well aware that building simulation has long been relied upon to tell us what we know about buildings at the uh, design stage and also sometimes when they are built. Uh, in recent years, there's been increased scrutiny on the building performance side, increased awareness of um, the performance gap and um, what that how that gap um, um, exists between design and operation and we've had some pretty negative press out there and um, this is just some examples uh, planning regulations overlook heat so developers build death traps uh, when developers cut corners on design occupants usually pay the price sometimes with their lives this one which is um, not very nice uh, homeowners and companies are paying double the amount they expect for gas and electricity because building modelers are illiterate when it comes to energy saving measures. So, um, you know, there's a question um, about the, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've argued internally about they're trying to compare apples and oranges, um, but have we brought some of this on ourselves um, is uh, an open question. There's also increased recognition of the true impact that build environment has. Uh, it's driving our ambitious aspirations for building performance. So obviously COP26 is uh, very much in our thoughts at the moment. There were some um, excellent agreement made, agreements made, uh, but also a big clamour for uh, we need more and we need to do this uh, a lot more quickly. So similarly for the building simulation community, uh, besides um, understanding what, what we need to do with the uh, current agreements, we should be discussing what more can we do and how more quickly can we do that. So there's been a huge amount of documentation um, and guidance over the recent years. And this is just a very, very select example um, from the IPCC, um, Yes, climate change is here. We're, we're in trouble. We need to try and find uh, and, and, and get our way out of it. Um, we talk about the climate emergency. There's been a huge amount of effort trying to um, deliver some of these guidance and point us in the right direction. Uh, and this uh, just another example where, where we're just starting to talk about uh, fit for the future. You know, it is what we're doing, uh, where we're designing buildings, where how we're positioning them fit the future. Uh, some would say that you know the quick answer is no. We need to change what we're doing. So never has building modelling been so important, and never has it been so accountable. 
So this all background um, led to the vision. We've been talking about it for a while. Uh, we've now pulled together as a group this vision document um, and we've pulled it together with the purposes of inspiring research and change in order to deliver comfortable health of buildings that promote the well-being of its users while meeting the climate emergency. So when I read this um, statement that Darren Coppins made, uh, the following examples of where our vision could lead the industry, um, it evoked a uh, a reaction in me. Um, this was the reaction. Be more ambitious. Be more confident. And shout from the rafters. So when I first came into the industry in the mid 90s, um, it was very much a, a case of what I call post-mortem designs where um, as building simulation person, there was very, very little opportunity to influence the designs. Um, and over uh, the last uh, 25 years or so, um, we are um, seeing more and more, we're getting more and more um, complex models earlier on in the design process, which is great. And um, there's been some many, many fantastic efforts, uh, writing material, um, trying to bring out a change in direction. I showed some of that earlier. But sometimes I worry we're, we're like a, a hamster in, a, in the wheel, where our legs are going around like crazy, trying to bring about this change, but we're not actually getting very far. Um, I think we need to be getting, uh, we need to get better at using sil building simulation to identify the low hanging fruit on our projects so that we can um, actually um, have a greater impact. And we know that a change is coming and it could hit us really, really quickly. So you may have heard me uh, talk at previous uh, events we've held that we may be moving to an era of, um, of using hundreds or, or even thousands of different scenarios instead of the tens of scenarios that we may currently be using in order to evolve our designs uh, and we may be throwing 90% of those results away once we've captured some of the key metrics um, to help us position the design but it is us the building simulation community who will be bringing about that change and if we are to meet the challenges of the climate emergency we need to have a controlled drive of that change and we need to shout about it we have the skills we have the ambition and we have the passion to do this. So we need to change the routine. Think about changing the routine and encourage some of that fresh thinking. Uh, what can we achieve without boundaries? Um, how can we integrate different performance requirements into the same models, optimize all the parameters included embodied carbon, daylight, comfort, energy and air quality? We need better prediction and modeling of human interaction with buildings and better optimization of the building for different occupancy behaviors and um, building control strategies that may come about um, as a result of that and the system's designs. We need to be able to embrace the Industrial Revolution 4.0. This is another shout out. Um, if any of you out there have skills in this area, um, we need to be able to wrap our heads around this and please make yourself known and um, and uh, we'll, we'll be able to hopefully help drive this um, a lot more quickly than we would do otherwise. So we need to consider the brief and the control risk. So modelling can no longer be considered a tick box exercise for regulatory or sustainability compliance assessments. It's about optimising the client and stakeholder collaboration to identify the correct brief and targets, identifying importance factors for the best outcome. It's about modeling early, keeping the predictions and targets up to date, and then incorporating the unknowns and mitigating associated risk to project and performance outcomes. So when Darren wrote these um, four points, the word tick box, which I've made bold, um, again, revoked a reaction in me. So I'd just like to talk about that 
at some length. <laughs> so how do we move away from the mindset of minimum cost driving our designs? I don't think we're very good at defining value, but can we start to use building simulations in much better ways to drive the narrative of value over cost? So if compliance-led design is poor practice and performance-led design good practice, how can we describe best practice? So if, for example, a building does not use parametric optimization in its design evolution, when we know that can deliver significant improvements and savings, then how can we call our designs best practice when we don't use these current technologies? If, for example, a minimum ventilation rate is set for a particular application and it's judged that the design is non-compliant if you don't meet that flow rate, and then your performance-led design clearly demonstrates a more efficient design with a lower ventilation rate, how, we can, how can we make sure that it can be applied as better than compliant even though the minimum target hasn't been met. We've had some way to go to work through some of these issues. Uh, so following uh, honest accounting, if you feel that some of my generalizations that I've made here don't apply to you, then I say, fantastic, you get it and you're applying good practice. But I also like to remind you that your role extends beyond the sharing of your knowledge to the users around you. The difficult conversations are influencing the decision makers who may not ever have ever opened up a specialist software package in their life. It's about influencing the money people who may, need, may have been trained to think in terms of cost instead of value. So if you're doing that, then shout it from the rafters. Say not just what's been done, but why it was done and the benefits gained. We need far more trickle down from the success stories than we uh, that we can generate. So what I'm saying here is not in my mind controversial. It's just a statement of fact backed up by the many guidance documents out there that state what to do, what to use for design purposes and what to use to check that minimum compliance targets have been met. So that a compliance scheme will be suboptimal by design and a performance led scheme should exceed all minimum compliance targets. We need to challenge and promote software development. So this is about encouraging collaboration between modeling community and software developers, incorporating feedback and embracing change. It's about promoting under the hood understanding of how software works to support modelers on the implications of their decision making, use of defaults, assumptions, simplifications and limitations. It's about the greater interoperability and automation between specialist packages and also digital engineering. On the collaboration side, it's about sharing the data and expertise to the industry's wider benefit authoring new and updated existing technical publications, encouraging the sharing of models across project stages. And on the skills side, it's about identifying those skills gap, gaps and developing training and certification options. It's about helping modelers to understand external influences that may affect their predictions, understanding the risks and uncertainties associated with construction impacting their modelled performance, including uh, fabric services, installation controls, commissioning errors, developing methods to predict and prevent such issues. And then what additional skills do we need for an operational stage in order to improve comfort and reduce consumption? So that's just a very, very quick overview, overview background and context for our vision document. Please do download it. We'll, um, if you don't pick it up from the chat, um, it will be on our website soon. And if you want to get involved, if you want to be part of that next uh, generation, please do send us an email at vision at .org. So at this point, I would like to introduce the panel. 
Um, so we have, um, besides myself, five people in the panel, David, Richard, Nick, Fred, and uh, another Richard. Um, and um, I'll ask them to come in that order um, when they answer the various questions which I'll show on the next slide. I've also included Alan Jones from EGSL, who can't um, unfortunately be with us on the panel today, but he's left me uh, a, a few slides that I'll share with you, assuming we have sufficient time. So besides furnishing the panel members with the uh, vision document, we've also um, asked them to think about these questions. Um, how might your software respond to the Net Zero 2050 challenge? How might digital twinning and any other aspects of the fourth industrial revolution influence your development plans? And then uh, how are you differentiating between climate change mitigation and adaptation within your strategic vision for the software. Quite often it's uh, uh, convoluted and we're not sure whether we're talking about mitigation, adaptation or a bit of both. And then what skills and training do we need to order to, what we do we need in order to bring about this vision? So I'll be asking them to spend up to three minutes to respond to any or all of those questions. If you've got any chat um, questions, I'll, I think I'll wait because uh, we're running possibly a little bit late. I'll wait for them to all to finish and then I'm pick out some of those questions um, or ask some myself. So I'd like to invite Dave to um, reveal himself and give him give us his response. OK, thanks, Darren. Um, consider be revealed. I'll just share my screen. OK, so. Um, I guess before I start, some really fantastic presentations um, and from my perspective, great to see so many uh, of them feature in Design Builder. Well done to uh, everybody that was shortlisted and good luck uh, for the for the announcement to follow. So in the context of, of this session, um, I'm going to ignore what in reality are some uh, critical social and financial elements of the triple bottom line and just focus on um, the technical aspects. So in recent years, uh, Design Builder have released cutting edge capabilities, uh, some of which you can see here, including 3D ground modeling, design optimization, scripting. These all represented significant progression in, in mainstream tools and can all help to minimize emissions. In the near future, we'll be releasing tools, including uh, model calibration toolkit, location specific weather file generation, um, to help with building calibration and, and future climate risk assessment. Regarding the digital twinning, we've been partnering with UCL to develop a, a calibration toolkit that, that creates a, a, a digital twin. Some of that work, work is showcased in SIBZ TM63, and you can see a summary here. The relevant data is collected from the building here, um, and the, it's then analysed um, and cleaned uh, and then used to generate the model inputs that go into Design Builder like occupancy and equipment schedules. Uh, and then on the right hand side here you can see um, the analysis tools that provide key insights from the, uh, the simulations that you run and then those results from the digital twin are fed back to the, um, the building's BMS to optimise in use performance. Many of these elements um, have already been released and more will follow over the next year or so. So this next image summarises uh, Design Builder's main functionality related to both climate change and, um, sorry, mitigation and adaptation. From your one Design Builder model, you can run all of the different analyses that, that you see here and more advanced tools like um, opt optimization, parametric stuff and, and scripting um, can help push beyond normal modeling and really push the boundaries of high performance building design. The same tools can be used to help with uh, adaptation, um, optimizing for thermal comfort, assessing compliance with standards like TM52 and TM59, for example, and the new weather tools that I mentioned, um, they'll further help you to, to assess climate risk 
and adaptation possibilities. So finally, on to skills and training. High performance building design has evolved rapidly in recent years, and modelers now often need to learn and use multiple tools to deliver their designs. They need access to high quality on demand training content to help refresh knowledge and simulation skills quickly, including uh, an important aspect is QA checking because models are now that much more sophisticated. Um, it's become an increasingly um, important aspect. I also think training and communication and other soft skills are becoming more important. And that's really to help clients and design teams understand the rationale and benefits of those ever more sophisticated performance designs. OK, thanks, Darren. Thank you very much. Um, if you can unshare that and I'll ask uh, Richard Tippenham to take over. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, uh, there, David. Uh, just to echo David's comments, uh, yeah, some excellent presentations there. I think it was really exciting uh, stuff going on uh, with all the uh, applicants. So good luck, everybody, with your your entries. Um, I've uh, I've not actually prepared any any slides. So I was brought in at rather late notice, but I'm uh, I've got some uh, comments prepared for questions one to three. So uh, the first question. How might your software respond to the net zero challenge? Uh, I think firstly, the, the, the most important thing is that uh, the, the, the role of an accurate modeling tool can't be understated. Uh, it's essential that we, we have a tool which can accurately predict operational energy demand in, in practice. Um, as most of uh, our viewers are aware, uh, regulatory compliance tools don't fit that bill. And that's resulted in the, uh, the well-documented compliance gap. So uh, I, I represent the uh, the IES consultancy. I'm the, I'm the UK uh, business uh, development manager, and we're seeing a, an increased number of clients asking us for accurate operational energy demand models under protocols such as SIB 254, Neighbours, and the BREEM GN32 standard. Um, and we use the the IES software suite to uh, to work with those those um, requirements. Um, applying the Apache HVAC modeling tool, Macroflow uh, and Python scripting um, to produce uh, highly accurate output data. Um, we've also got some very exciting new updates to the software, including ground modeling, which are uh, going to be um, incorporated next year. Um, of course, uh, the, the consultancy team do offer support to IES users as well for this higher level of, uh, of analyses. Uh, in terms of question two, um, relating to digital twins, um, I think really the, the, the key word here is verification. Um, as an industry, we're quite poor at post-occupancy um, verification. Um, and to resolve this, we, we use uh, the, the ICL uh, software suite, um, which allows us to create a digital twin of, of buildings post occupancy. Um, we can apply the the iScan tool to um, model uh, the metering strategy from a building and apply that to the digital twin. So we've got um, an exact mirrored copy of metering that we can compare before and after, and that allows us to um, compare uh, our theoretical modeling with reality and then learn it through that process. I can see that becoming a, an increasingly important um, methodology as, as, as time goes by. Uh, I think that the higher energy costs that we're seeing at the minute will hopefully push a lot of clients to, to reconsider their, their take on, uh, on accurate energy modeling. Um, so of course this closes the, the compliance gap. Um, and then finally, uh, just on question four there regarding training, um, I think, yes, that we will need a lot more competence in this this area. So I think teaching at university level is very important to to bring bring through that new blood into the uh, into the industry. Um, and some great opportunities, obviously, for uh, SIBSI engineers to, to really lead the role on net zero carbon modeling um, to inform designs at concept stage rather than uh, once a once a scheme's already been fleshed out. So uh, that's it from me. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, <coughs> Richard. Um, I'll ask Nick now to take the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully you can, uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully you can, uh, everyone can see that okay. So uh, Monodraft, so I'm Nick Hopper, Technical Director from Monodraft. And uh, I'm presenting here the, um, as, a, as a product manager, uh, as manufacturer rather than a software producer. So on some of those slides, on some of the questions, I've, I've gone at it slightly differently. So I'm presenting our HVR Zero um, product, which we developed last year and we launched to market this year. And it tackles a number of different issues. Predominantly, we designed it from, from the ground up to be a, uh, a net zero carbon product. So we've looked at the embodied carbon of this product from start to finish, and uh, we are offsetting all of the carbon associated with the manufacture of this product. We also looked at the energy strategy with it and incorporated both ventilation profiles, but also heat recovery. And it switches between different ventilation strategies based on different approaches for ventilation to the room, whether it needs air tempering, whether it needs mixing of ventilation air. And when it comes to digital twins, I thought that an interesting aspect of this is the control strategy. And what we've um, enabled with this system is a full digital uh, link with the unit. So like a building management system, which we're calling more like a ventilation management system, this uh, this unit relays the data out uh, using a 4G connection and we're able to assess data from the units in real time. And then it's a question of us then taking that data and being able to utilize that on our building simulation uh, that we conduct prior to the buildings being used. But this is proving very useful to, to look at analyzing um, performances, but also looking at um, how the systems are um, uh, in faults that we're finding uh, within the construction of the buildings. So um, that is my presentation, so um, I'll hand back if that's OK. Thank you very much. Can I ask um, Fred if you're here to take over? Are you here, Fred? If not, there was a chance he was going to be late. Um, I suggest we jump to the second Richard in Simscoe. Yes, thanks, Taryn. And nice to see just before me also some some pictures uh, that were used uh, uh, with SimScale to to model the, the CFD analysis. So um, I'm Richard. I'm product manager for AC applications uh, at SimScale. If you don't know SimScale, uh, we are the first cloud native simulation platform, and we are committed to making engineering simulation technically and economically accessible. So we cover fluid, structural, as well as thermal physics, and it's delivered by a web browser uh, to all of our more than 300,000 users worldwide. So uh, I've prepared answers to questions one and four. So <clears throat> how does SimScale help to respond to the Net Zero 2050 challenge? So in order to implement uh, more efficient heating and ventilation strategies, the expected gains need to be quantified and optimized for including a variety of related aspects. And this makes it a, a complex problem to optimize. Uh, we as SimScale are committed to make the tools that are necessary to assess multiple aspects of building and urban spaces, make it truly accessible to a broader audience of designers, architects, and obviously engineers. And the earlier in the design process, the better to really embrace performance-driven design. The cloud-based aspect of SimScale enables a high level of collaboration across the interdisciplinary and distributed teams, and at the same time, leveraging the practically unlimited compute capacity, evaluating many design alternatives simultaneously to find the best outcome. And the key for being adopted in such a diverse field as the built environment is enabling interoperability between many different tools and a seamless integration into design workflows, which we are enabling at SimScale with our um, application programming interface, short DAPI. 
SimScale is currently focusing on urban microclimate analysis and including uh, outdoor thermal comfort and indoor um, thermal comfort as well as air quality assessment and the ability to link this to third party tools seamlessly. Regarding the skills and training and what we need in order to, to bring this vision to life. First of all, um, regarding skills and training, awareness is the first step. So there are tools available for designers and architects that can, that can be implemented early in the design process for was, what was previously perceived as complex analysis only for simulation experts, such as computational fluid dynamics. And spreading the knowledge that solution exists is the first step. And as, a, and as, a, uh, as an example, we have developed a highly automated and robust application for a full year evaluation of pedestrian wind comfort in urban spaces, which can be used with close to no training and has all the best practices from CFD included automatically. Second, the basic understanding of the key physics and the performance metrics is obviously still mandatory and having multidisciplinary teams with designers and engineers which work closely to get together will improve the knowledge building process within, for example, an architectural practice. And collaboration is key as well as capturing the knowledge within the processes themselves. So we're confident that there is no contradiction between increasing complexity in numerical simulations and at the same time enabling a much broader user base early in the design process. As an example, maybe a little bit far-fetched, but taking photos from your smartphone 10, 15 years ago, you could barely recognize a person in the picture. And today everyone can take stunning photos just with a simple tap on the screen, not even push of a button. And we can even do much more. We can fully record the scene in 3D with depth resolution up to a few millimeters. Right? And we are confident that similar advancements will come to simulation technology and help us solve one of the biggest challenges of this generation, the net zero environment. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm now going to share. So this um, presentation. Sorry, I missed that is um, if you can see this on the screen was sent by Alan Jones from EDSL and um, what I say will be obviously uh, quite different words to what Alan will say would have said but um, I'll, I'll try and give it my tilt on it so this is a um, model from One New Exchange London and it was called Excuse me. It was called uh, Calibrated Energy Models, the Basic of Neighbours. So uh, for most buildings, there's uh, we talked about performance gap between actual and uh, predicted usage. How, how do we make actual usage start to look like simulated usage in terms of kilowatt hours per year? So you know, we again talked about post occupancy performance modelling and how we can close that performance gap. So real buildings are obviously subject to natural variations in weather, occupant behaviour and poor management with some of the key reasons. And can we employ this uh, post occupancy performance modelling to close that gap, making the kilowatt hours per year look similar, actual and simulated? So this is a slide on building operations. Uh, and it's all about the data um, and collecting the data. So um, you have a weather station, um, you've got metered data, you have your BMS, you have your utility bills, and you have your O&M data, and that's all being fed into the model. And then you've got um, the modeling of complex systems, such as the um, plant room model. When I say complex systems, this is our sort of category of advanced HVAC that we've talked about. Um, obviously, um, you know, we're see a lot more on the heat pump side. Um, it's got boilers. Um, uh, it's got fan coil and uh, high handling units, chillers, etc. So, you know, it's about the uh, representation of our 
systems. But I, I raise a question um, which um, I talked a little bit about earlier before about, which is um, if we've got these advanced techniques now and we're not using them, how good are our uh, modelling results and how good are our uh, decision make? How good is our decision making as, as a result of that? And I, and I question that we should perhaps be taking some of the um, atypical current methods and really, really pushing that into becoming typical methods. So again, this is another complex model, airside um, model using um, quite a few um, systems. When I say complex, advanced, HVAC model with lots of uh, components in there. And um, again, with these representations, um, you know, how, how good are those representations? How can we um, calibrate that against um, true performance is an area that we need to start to think about. But ultimately, you know, we talked about the performance gap. It is possible within software with sufficient data overlaying to get pretty good um, correlations. Um, yeah, th th there's uh the the performance gap isn't necessarily or or anything really to do with the algorithms within the software not being good representations there are some um some uncertainty for example on um constructed fabric but it's ultimately um how we run the programs and how that ties in with reality so um the calibrated models can actually reduce that gap and give us um pretty good um, accurate representations. So, uh, Darren, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, just quickly, that the committee has, sorry, the judging panel has come back. Uh, and also, Fred has joined uh, the call as well. Fantastic. Let's give Fred an opportunity to reveal himself, have his three minutes, and then we will go to the announcements for the awards. There's not much time for questions. Fred? OK, uh, hi, Darren. Can you hear me OK? Yes, fine. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm purposely cancelling my, my, my camera. So this will just be a, a, an audio um, simply because I, I got my, my, my COVID jab today. So I'm, I'm looking and feeling rough. So, so forgive the lack of camera use here. Um, yeah, uh, really very, very pleased to be part of the, the Building Simulation Awards. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, what, what we are doing from our point of view, I think uh, you've already been talking a little bit about simulation, is using the open source product, uh, uh, Open Foam, um, to uh, be doing modeling in buildings, especially to understand uh, things like uh, COVID response, clean air circulation, um, fresh air circulation, um, the, the, the extraction or the capture or the deposition uh, of uh, AGPs, that's particulate matter. Um, but in general, this is evolving and COVID has been a really good catalyst, uh, really to be beginning again to concentrate on, uh, on, on air quality, uh, especially in, in, in enclosures. So that's our primary focus here. Um, and, and really, that was just my 30 seconds. Uh, is there anything specific uh, that, that I've missed already that I can add uh, in terms of discussion? Um, it'll be great just to hear your your thoughts on the climate emergency and building simulation generally. You know, the, gen the general direction, um, anything you've got on the sort of 20, 10 to 20 year front would be good. Yeah, I, I've, I've, been, I've been trying to make a, a kind of a, a balanced assessment on this one in, in terms of looking at, uh, at, at various building sectors. Let, let's call it school classrooms or new hospitals or, or, or office buildings. And, and trying to make an assessment on you know, where we'll be in 10, 20 or 30 years in terms of new bills compared with existing or old bills. OK, I'm not sure what that percentage is, is looking looking like. Um, it, it's not going to be 100 percent of new bills. Right. So uh, a, a lot of the, the, the building states that we're walking in at the moment into at the moment for schools and hospitals and, and offices will still be around in, 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 in 30 years time. So I think at the moment. What, whatever we think is going to work well with retrofitting, I think will be at least as good um, uh, working with, 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 with new builds. And I need to have a slightly better idea of what new builds are going to be, uh, going to be looking like uh, to be able to build that vision. I, I know I'm completely shir shirking your question, but uh, um, you know, re re retrofits for me is a very, very important focus because that's what we're uh, living and breathing at the moment. And thank you for raising that. Yes, it's, a, it's an area we don't um, necessarily focus on as much as we should do, but that's where we're going to be 
having the biggest impacts. Um, so um, I'd like to thank everyone on the panel. Um, you are our sponsors. Thank you for that um, as well. Um, and now I'd like to pass back to Darren to announce the awards results. Thank you, Darren. Uh, hopefully you've had a great interim session. I look forward to uh, watching that on the video on the on the on the rerun. Uh, I am just finalizing the last few slides uh, in uh, presenting this. So if you give me one moment, I'll just pop them on the screen. First up, we have Gabriella, who's going to announce the Young Modeler Awards. Thanks, Darren. Um, so firstly, I would like to thank all applicants for your entries. We're very pleased to see all so many champions in the UK and abroad, and we encourage you to keep up with the good work and get engaged with the Building Simulation Group. As Darren uh, Wolf mentioned, we, we're keen to support young modelers through our events and also training capabilities through search, for example. So I'm going to be very brief on this and without further ado, I would like to announce the 2021 Young Modeler winner. And this is uh, Nishesh Jain. Uh, he was actually the runner up for last year awards and we're delighted to nominate you as the main winner of this year. We are very impressed with your cont continuous support to the industry, academia, and publications and participating in publications actually, uh, like the development of TM63, co-authoring TM61, and current engagement with CIPC TM54. So we've got a lot of TMs to put in your in your CVs. Um, and we think that you have successfully demonstrated how you're advocating building simulation locally and also abroad through engagement with ASHRAE, BIPSA, and sharing knowledge across um, sectors through um, your involvement with UCL and Design Builder Software Package. We believe that you wholly embody all the characteristics to hold this award. So congratulations, Nishesh. And I would invite you to say a few words. You know you're online. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you, Gabriela. Um, so yeah, I'm glad to receive this award. And I thank the Building Simulation Group and the judging panel for recognizing my work um, through. And for the last two and a half years, I have been working as a KTP associate at UCL and on a design builder software and Innovate UK co-funded project. And my work, as Gabriela said, revolves around using modeling and simulation related to in-use performance of buildings. I focus on developing best performance methods and tools to drive the industry in the right direction and have contributed and co-authored some recent CFC technical memorandums. Um, I have, uh, I believe that building simulation is an integral part in making buildings perform to meet the low energy, uh, low carbon targets. Therefore, now I actively participate in discussions about ensuring that simulation delivers on what it promises and provides realistic and accountable solutions. Um, so I tend to keep working with uh, organizations such as CIPC, with the Building Simulation Group, to ensure that our community can address the evolving climate challenges and achieve the CIPC Building Simulation Group's 2050 vision. So uh, to keep the personally important part for the end, I would like to thank uh, the wonderful people I work with at UCR and Design Builder, the guidance and mentorship I've received from Professor Dejan Momovic and Dr. Esfan Berman from UCL, and Dr. Andy Tyndale and Dave Cocking from Design Builder. It's been wonderful. I'm grateful for them to encourage me and give me opportunities uh, to perform and contribute. So in a short time, um, I find myself at home in a community filled with friendly and helpful people. And getting this prestigious award uh, makes me even more determined to keep on contributing. So thank you. Thank you very much, Nishesh. Uh, very well deserved. Um, I would now like to present the winners, uh, uh, or the winner, I should say. Um, there we go, you should now actually see my screen. Uh, yeah, so uh, 
I'd first like to say that I was very impressed by the inspirational quality and originality of the entries that we had this year in the awards. Um, we've been running it for a number of years now, and every time we get some fantastic work from real groundbreaking breaking, uh, original modelling um, to uh, run-of-the-mill modelling, but done uh, robustly and well, and, and it's all those sorts of entries that, that we like to see uh, and look forward to hopefully getting next year. Uh, I would like to send a special thank you to everyone who took the time this year to enter the competition and hope that you'll continue to inspire your peers and your day to day activities and also hope that you'll enter again next year and inspire others to do so as well. So thanks to everyone who entered the awards. Um, it was very difficult for the three of us judges to choose the winner this year. Um, it is every year, uh, but especially so this year, we had a good uh, diverse range of finalists um, and shortlisted entries. And uh, actually choosing between them was very difficult because each have their, their merits. Um, so, you know, they're all in the in the top of their, their modelling capabilities and ultimately uh, Every one of the shortlisted entries that we've seen here today are winners having been hand selected and given the opportunity to present their work and their expertise today. So without further procrastination, uh, I'd like to present um, the, uh, what, the first of our two runners up and these are in absolutely no particular order. Um, we have two runners up and a winner. So the first runner up is uh, Ketki uh, Meta. We particularly liked um, your modelling of the photobio uh, reactor. Um, we thought this was really original modelling. Um, we did take the time to view your, your presentation again so that we could see it in full. Um, it was a particularly robust application, uh, including um, the building calibration, looking at the bio interface, as well as the cost aspects, considering also what the alternative opportunities uh, could be as well. So congratulations, um, very good work. Um, our next runner up, uh, and apologies if I have the incorrect name, I didn't actually have a name on my entry for this one, but I've got Atina um, Gunaim for the design of the library extension featuring a parametric dynamic facade. And please pipe up if I have got your name wrong so that I can correct it. Um, we thought that this um, was a really very nice example of the joining together of a number of different types of tools uh, and Brevit. Um, we liked some uh, the adoption of some of the uh, sort of nature based design and the consideration of how we actually moved around the uh, the, the, the different um, uh, facades and, and how you looked at adjusting the shading to suit actually the weather, but also optimising the view out. So we felt actually that that was a, a fantastic example. And we move on now to our winner. So the winner for this year's 2021 Building Simulation Awards is Patricia Pino. Uh, this is the presentation whereby we looked at the COVID-19 and the work environment. And for this, we particularly like the way that existing tools were leveraged to consider a complex and new problem to a level of detail that provided a high level of robustness in the modeling. It had very good visual aspects as often CFD does, but actually in the demonstration of what um, the decisions being made has in the impact of, of uh, potential COVID spread in the workplace, uh, and we felt that it's this this modeling is um, um, pioneering at the time and also extremely um, important to be recognized. So we felt that this is a, uh, a, a very worthy winner this year. So uh, congratulations, Patricia, uh, as the winner. Would you like to say a few words if you're still with us? Um, yes, thank you so much. Um, obviously, I, I'm extremely happy that um, this got chosen. God knows it wasn't. It wasn't a, a sole effort. It, many hands went into developing a methodology, making it as robust as you have said. And um, and it also was extremely challenging because um, even though many of us come from the thermal environment world, this incorporated as well 
having to learn a lot about the virus itself and how it might behave and, and how to capture the highest levels of risk. Um, and of course, there is the, the human element, which is always in, in these projects and, and is, is very important when you try to interpret the results and how to give them some applicability to industry so that they can have value for, uh, for the people who design buildings and who actually have um, you know, the, the, the power to change practical aspects of, of, of how we use buildings. So um, I hope that, you know, that this, um, this attempt at modeling the um, COVID risk as well, it, it will continue to be developed and become better as the knowledge of the virus improves and as we uh, identify weaknesses and improve upon them. And as I said, it will continue to be a group effort. So thank you everybody who was involved in this. That's great. Thank you for uh, thank you for your words. And uh, yeah, congratulations and well done. Um, it just leaves me now really to, to thank the members of the judging panel uh, for taking the time uh, to uh, spend today going through the um, uh, the entries. Uh, as well as those that went through the young modeler entries and spent their time going through the judging process. And uh, with that, I will hand back to Darren Wolf to, to close. Thank you very much, Darren. And can not only congratulations to the winners, congratulations to um, all the entries as well. So very, very well done. So it's um, my job to say a few more thanks. Um, I'd like to thank uh, my executive team and building simulation group who have worked um, tirelessly over the last uh, few weeks in particular um, on um, organizing the awards there's um, Alex who um, again has been fantastic in pulling everything together coordinating and um, driving the sessions today um, who was supported by his deputy event secretary Hua um, as well. There's um, Vasiliki on the uh, social um, media side, our social media secretary who has been promoting it and um, Darren in all sorts of guises. Um, you've seen him on the judging, you've seen him supporting me on the uh, Vision 2050 document um, as well. So a big thank you not only to the exec team, um, the reviewers in the committee and outside the committee that have um, stepped up um, the managing of the conflicts, the working over the weekends, um, it is all happening in the background. In addition to that, big thank you to Jade and her colleagues from um, SIPSI who have um, supported us um, there. And um, so finally, I'd like to um, say um, we're very much looking forward to next year as well. Please um, get your entries in early and um, we, we'll uh, probably have exactly the same format and um, took us a while to um, generate this format um, and um, we're hoping to uh, market it perhaps a bit earlier and perhaps try and do things a little bit earlier, give you a bit more time. So um, on that um, note, I'd like to um, close the Building Simulation um, Awards 2021 and um, have a good day. Thank you.